Cole, take it away. Hey, everybody. So uh, some of you may know me as the director of technology for Nebula. Some of you guys might know me as the cloud advisor of the Linux Foundation, which is pretty much the hat that I'll be wearing today. And uh, you all know me as the guy who almost got me on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to be talking, actually before I, before I get into that, I also want to say that, that uh, Nebula is working with Dave and we're working with uh, a, a lot of companies that uh, obviously there's, there's tons of meetups around OpenStack in San Francisco at Hacker Dojo. Uh, and Josh does a fantastic job of putting that on. We have spun up uh, OpenStack Silicon Valley and OpenStack Seattle for those that have an interest in that uh, on LinkedIn. So I'd encourage you guys to join the OpenStack uh, Silicon Valley LinkedIn group. Um, you'll see an, an announcement soon from uh, Canonical and Nebula working with Dave and uh, Cloud Center to put on an OpenStack Silicon Valley event here. So with that, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, why OpenStack is the cloud equivalent to the kernel. And I promise I'll be fast. We'll let Joe and Mike uh, get on with this since the timer says half an hour and I was supposed to be done 20 minutes ago. <laughs> So who knows what a kernel is? Hopefully a lot of people, good, at least we're technical. So what's, uh, what's interesting about a, you know, a kernel, I highlighted the, uh, uh, the related part to what OpenStack is. You know, essentially a kernel is something that abstracts uh, resources away from an underlying set of, uh, in, in the case of a Linux kernel, machine code, in the case of OpenStack, um, the services that run underneath what the user cares about. So in Linux, you know, kernel translates things like um, you know, CPU memory, etc., and maps those to running applications. So cloud kernel, you can see, uh, effectively does the exact same thing, where a Linux kernel, obviously, sitting here abstracts away CPU memory devices and translates those into you know, your, your process tree that you see and, and, and has reserved memory, CPU, et cetera. Uh, OpenStack does the exact same thing. Uh, you know, you've, got, you've got your workload application layer and these are, the, these are the VMs that you spin up and you run as services. You have OpenStack, which is basically the translation layer and abstraction layer for that. And then you have all of the resources underneath. So on the Linux side, you've got these resources. On the OpenStack side, you've got your network which, by the way, uh, based on today's epic failure with networking, you will not see any code contributions from me to quantum. <laughs> uh, so you've got your, uh, your compute, your object storage, et cetera, uh, your memory, your block storage. So the tenet of OpenStack, the tenet of, of Linux, actually, was to be a monolithic kernel. And there's, there's several different types of kernels, right? There's, there's monolithic kernels, there's uh, microkernels like herd, et cetera. Uh, Mac OS X basically uses a microkernel. Um, but the idea is, in all of them, is to be pluggable, right? Uh, especially in Linux, you've got uh, this ability, this, this, this great ability to load kernel modules directly into the kernel, into a running kernel. So, and you know, monolithic kernels are hard. OpenStack, technically, is very, who's deployed OpenStack? Who thought it was easy? Exactly. Um, it, it, they're tough. It's a, it's a lot of services that need orchestration. It's a lot of services that need um, a lot of love and care in, in, in making sure that, that runs correctly. Uh, you look at Linus's first post about the Linux kernel, and it was, this is not going to be a big project. This is going to be for basically uh, x86 hardware. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you've got people like Matt Donk, who wrote DKMS, uh, allows you to dynamically load kernel modules into uh, the kernel, uh, into a running kernel. And OpenStack follows that exact same tenet, right? You've got pluggable endpoints that you can add on top of, on top of OpenStack. Uh, if you look at where OpenStack started, uh, which I don't have a slide for, but in the Austin release, you had compute storage, um, and by Diablo, you had you know compute storage. Um, sort of uh, uh, you know, glance for image service. Uh, inside of Essex, you may or may not see quantum. Uh, you've got Keystone. So there's a lot of new things that are, that are happening. And all of that is, is core to the, the kernel space. Everybody with me? Well, kernels aren't enough, right? Um, who knows the name Richard Stallman? <laughs> so, so if it was up to Richard, I, I 
very generously put GNU Linux there for Richard. Uh, you know, you look at what the kernel is and, and then what a, what, a, what a distro is, and you've got, you've got this package in Linux called Core Utils, right? Core Utils gives you some amazing abilities that a running kernel would do uh, everybody in this room no good if you weren't able to run PS, if you weren't able to run LS, if you weren't able to have the bash shell, et cetera. Uh, OpenStack has the exact same thing, right? You've got APIs, you've got Yuka tools, you've got Nova Manage, you've got all the Swift tools. Uh, so kernels aren't enough. You need these sort of core utils, which is, um, <coughs> there is a, there's a method to the madness here that I'll, I'll talk about in, in two slides. Uh, but the bottom line is, pluggability is great, uh, <coughs> and kernels aren't enough. You need, a, you, basically, you need to build a community around this. And you look at the Linux community, and it's very healthy, right? You look at the fact that there's Debian, and Fedora, and Gentoo, and Nopix, and Ubuntu, and uh, Red Hat, uh, you know, Slackware, by the way, is kind of a personal favorite. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, if anybody's interested about the history of Slackware, the very first Linux distro, come find me, and I'll tell you a fantastic story about how I got into Linux and, and, and why Slackware is called Slackware. Uh, it's a very good story. So, um, you know, on the, on the OpenStack side, there's, there's plenty of room for competition, right? This actually generates a healthy uh, uh, corporate and enterprise ecosystem. <coughs> Nebula, Piston, Stack Ops, Cloud Stack, sounds like Swift Stack, uh, which I'm sorry, you don't have to get me the logo. Uh, so, so having distros in a way where services are wrapped up and presented to a user uh, in, a, in an organized way does make things a little easier. If anybody tried to, to run Linux back in you know, 1994, it was pretty tough. I mean, you had to compile a lot of things yourself. You had to set things up. And OpenStack is very much in that same situation today. It's very difficult to get deployed. It's even harder to get stable. Uh, so distros are good. This is actually what I wanted to talk to everybody about today. Um, as the Cloud Advisor Linux Foundation and the Linux Foundation's tenant itself, is to basically protect the kernel, right? You see Red Hat and Canonical and pretty much every company that was on that last distro slide as members of the Linux Foundation. In fact, Nebula just joined uh, the Linux Foundation. Uh, and the Linux Foundation exists primarily to keep the kernel from forking, uh, create a healthy ecosystem, and generate business opportunities for companies that want to get into um, that environment. Uh, Jim Zemlin is the executive director and he does a fantastic job of going and sort of um, driving the message of, you know, the kernel should be a standard and you don't see, you know, you don't see a lot of the external packages that exist at the distro level uh, inside of the kernel for a very specific reason. Uh, and, and, that, and that's because you need focus, right? You absolutely need focus when you're talking about a kernel. Uh, and again, relating that to OpenStack, uh, you've got things like Denave, Anybody? Workload as a service. Uh, these are these are things that you know that a foundation should technically determine if they should be part of the kernel. Uh, we are we are big advocates of Rackspace. We are big advocates of, of OpenStack. Uh, and so far, Rackspace has done the exact right thing at every step of the way. And their decision, who knows about the decision to open to, to basically build a foundation around this? Um, so recently, Lou Warman. Uh, and Jonathan Bryce and, and, and Jim uh, Curry held a session in, in Boston at the OpenStack Developer Summit um, on opening it up. And so in the next year, we'll see um, a lot of chatter and a lot of discussions happening around how that gets built. Um, I've got my own opinions on that from the Linux Foundation side. But the bottom line is OpenStack needs a foundation, period. Uh, there's plenty of, there, you know, Imagine if Red Hat owned the kernel. That, that could be bad, right? And I don't want to single out Red Hat. Imagine if Canonical owned it, or you know, if one entity owns something that, is, that should be so ubiquitous, it, it could be problematic. So um, why I'm here today uh, is basically to, to get you guys interested in this, right? You look at what, what Linux has with the Linux Foundation, setting charter, setting scope, being the, the fosters of that community, um, and really driving adoption. Um, I would encourage everybody, if you if you care, to to open you know to, to open your browser, um, go sign up for the foundation, and get your thoughts out there. Right now, the mailing list is pretty dead, um, and we don't want it to be. We want people to care about foundations. We want people to care about ubiquity, and the community is going to drive this. 
So with that, I want to turn it over to either Dave or Joe, Mike, and thank you for your time. Great. Thank you very much, Cole.